At a time of climate pledges and promises, globally, our governments still spend three times more public money on subsidising fossil fuels than renewable energy. Why is this? Although the raw price of renewables has fallen below the price of fossil fuels, fossil fuel subsidies remain one of the world's greatest hurdles in ensuring a transition towards net zero. Fossil fuel subsidies come in two forms. Production subsidies reduce the cost of producing fossil fuels and tend to be most common in developed countries where the money is spent developing infrastructure such as gas pipelines. Consumption subsidies, on the other hand, reduce the price of fossil fuels for the end user, such as the price of petrol and diesel or gas for cooking. This is much more common in lower income countries where the subsidies are required for citizens to afford essentials. Governments extend these subsidies to either allow consumers to continue buying fossil fuels or to ensure fossil fuel companies don't become bankrupt during challenging periods such as the pandemic. Governments do this because a stable supply and consumption of energy is needed to promote economic growth in their nation and thus ensure a high GDP. Most governments around the world have relatively short electoral cycles and are thus more likely to focus on short-term goals such as increasing GDP and decreasing current unemployment which can help them get re-elected rather than tackling systematic problems like energy infrastructure that a future government, or God forbid a rival party, could take credit for down the line. Each year, somewhere between 5 and 6 trillion dollars are spent on fossil fuel subsidies globally. This astonishing amount of money is being used to fund the most damaging companies in the world. If you were to rank fossil fuel subsidies as a country by GDP, it would be the third richest country in the world. Whilst the removal of subsidies would reduce carbon emissions, some say this will not solve the problem. This Nature Journal by Joel et al. discusses that sadly, the removal of fossil fuel subsidies alone would only make a small dent in global carbon emissions of around 2-3% compared to most countries' 2050 net zero targets. Although whilst this raw analysis suggests the direct effects of subsidy removal would be low, other researchers argue that indirect effects may be much more important. A reply to this article argues that when taken at face value, the research by Joel et al. can be misleading. The actual impacts, particularly when one considers the social and political effects, are far greater. They argue that subsidies to fossil fuel companies pose formidable financial, institutional and political obstacles to this transition, impeding the efficiency of greenhouse gas emission reduction strategies, and therefore removal of these subsidies will allow for the political freedoms to actually implement an effective carbon reduction policy. Some of this public spending can be pushed into renewable energy subsidies. This recent journal article shows, using Europe as a test case, that renewable energy subsidies are effective, with a 1% increase in subsidies leading to an increase in renewable generation of 0.4 to 1%. Therefore, if governments increase public spending into renewable subsidies, as well as decreasing fossil fuel subsidies, we will see a large increase in renewable energy generation, and have a hope of hitting net zero goals in the future. However, many predictions show that renewable subsidies are not set to increase to the height of current fossil fuel subsidies, which may free up future public money for healthcare and education. This begs the question then, why are renewable subsidies still so low? A big part of the answer is that renewables are already cheaper than fossil fuels in a lot of cases, and thus don't need the same infrastructure kickstart or end user discount. The other, less pretty half of the coin is fossil fuel lobbying. As we have seen recently at COP26, where there were more fossil fuel lobbyists than representatives of any one nation, fossil fuel lobbying is at the heart of modern day climate policy. And unfortunately, oil and gas companies have been very successful in protecting their own financial interests. The American Petroleum Institute, for example, funded by fossil fuel giants such as Exxon, Shell and BP, have been fighting against Biden's infrastructure bill. In an effort to slow down the transition to EVs, they claimed a rushed transition to electric vehicles is part of a government action to limit America's transportation choice. Rex Tillerson, the Exxon chief who went on to become Donald Trump's Secretary of State, once sat on the API board so it's easy to see how intertwined the fossil fuel industry is with politics. But it's not all doom and gloom. Between 2015 and 2020, 53 countries reformed their fossil fuel subsidies to some extent, either by reducing subsidies, increasing taxes on fossil fuels, or a combination of the two. On top of this, Joe Biden announced the target of removing $35 billion worth of fossil fuel subsidies over the coming decade. We've recently seen the promises given at COP26 in Glasgow, where nearly 200 countries agreed to speed up the end of fossil fuel subsidies and reduce the use of coal. But as Professor Harry von Asselt puts it, it's the discrepancy between the rhetoric and the reality that is starting to bite a little bit. We're figuring out that it's incredibly challenging to actually make it happen. Unfortunately, this discrepancy between rhetoric and reality isn't likely to change without public pressure. 
Fossil fuel subsidies are damaging our climate and preventing the growth of renewable energy infrastructure. And it's down to us as individuals to keep our governments accountable for these promises by making sure we vote for political parties who prioritise reducing fossil fuel subsidies as one of many steps to reaching net zero where you live. Make sure you protest when you feel it's needed, write to your political candidates and local representatives, and spread awareness on topics such as this. One of the best ways we can make a real difference to large-scale problems such as these is to educate ourselves and those around us so we can use that knowledge to take action in the right places. Please consider subscribing and click the bell icon if you'd like to stay up to date with our videos. And finally, a thank you to all our patrons who help make this content possible. If you want to support this type of content, please consider joining. Here you get early and ad-free access to our videos, bloopers and outtakes, and even contribute to polls on which topics we discuss and which charities see a share of our income. And as always, look after yourselves, each other, and most importantly, the planet around you. Thanks again, our Eden.